Okay. Let's see where we are. Dr. Abbott. Hi, how are you? Doing good. Not sure if you remember me, but I remember you from uh, when uh, Aung San Suu Kyi came to UFL. You were uh -huh. the panelist. You were the moderator, I believe. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when the uh, ambassador, um, oh, um, Mitchell, Mitchell. Uh, Mitchell, Mitchell came to UFL. Yeah. yeah. I was there. With you. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't understand English much back then. Well. Your English is is very good. Now, so well done. Uh, I, I I wish we weren't meeting again under these circumstances. I wish it was under different circumstances. Right. Um, of course. And but I'm sure we'll we'll get into that um, during the discussion. But I didn't think when we met last time that we would have a a, a recurrence of a coup. Uh, I think we were all very optimistic that yep. uh, times were changing. And unfortunately, that's not the case, sadly. Hi, Sabine. Hi, guys. How are you? How's everybody today? Thank you so much for uh, being on here. Hi, Sabine. Hey, Jason. And Etha, it's great to see you. Thank you for, you for making the time and to talk to our community about some of these really, really relevant um, global affairs that are happening across the world and affecting um, our local community members as well. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for actually hosting this. Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah. great idea. Great idea. We're just waiting for people to join. Um, I was telling everyone, Sabine, that we had about 40 some people sign up. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, it is. Um, so we'll see um, how many are able to actually join, but um, we'll just give them a couple minutes. Uh, well, we, not, not a couple minutes, <laughs> I should say, just a few more seconds and then we will start get started. Like eight seconds, countdown's on. Countdown now. <laughs> <laughs> We're efficient. Yes, not 10 yes. seconds, eight. They only get eight. They only get, that's right. All right, are you, well, uh, we're, good. yeah, go ahead. I was just going to make sure you were streaming it live on Facebook and recording because yes. we'd it like just, to post it. It looks like it just uh, started streaming. So now that it's streaming, I, I think we should get started and then um, people will join as they will. Um, first of all, I just want to say good afternoon to everybody and welcome and thank you all for joining us today for this special program um, on Myanmar. Uh, today's program is a joint effort between the World Affairs Council of Kentucky and Southern Indiana and the Louisville Metro's Office for Globalization. Um, we're very excited to have both uh, Sabine Nassim, who is the director of the Office of Globalization, and Amos, who is the project manager, uh, program manager, I should say, uh, in the office for joining us today. Uh, my name is Hyoyin Zhao. I am the executive director of the World Affairs Council of Kentucky and Southern Indiana. Um, we are a hub for international exchange, dialogue, and learning located in Louisville, Kentucky. And we are part of three large networks, uh, national networks, Global Ties US, the World Affairs Councils of America, and the Sister Cities International. Um, our organization facilitates a variety of international professional and youth exchanges year round, as well as speaker programs like this and educational opportunities for this region. So today we are really fortunate to have some individuals in our community uh, joining us to really help us unpack the sudden and dramatic developments in Myanmar. And as many of you know um, who's joining us, uh, the Myanmar's military has seized power in a coup on February 1st and ousted the democratically elected government officials, including its leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, the sudden power grab is seen as a serious setback for the country, which recently has made some gains despite its um, you know, controversial and severe treatment of minority populations. Um, so moderating our program today is going to be Amos Isramana, uh, Program Manager at the Office for Globalization. Our speakers are Dr. Jason Abbott, who's the Endowed Chair in Asian Democracy 
and director of the Center for Asian Democracy at the University of Louisville. As well as uh, we have Mr. Ene uh, Tha, who is the uh, leader with the Burmese community in Louisville, uh, Kentucky. Now, before I turn it over to Amos to start our program, just a few quick notes uh, about this. We are going to be um, recording this program as well as live streaming it on Facebook. Uh, we will have about 30 minutes of conversation and then we will open it up for questions. Um, just note that you can enter your questions at any time during this program and we will take them when the time comes. So without further ado, welcome and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Amos. Thank you so much, Shari, and, and uh, thank you World Affairs Council for you know all of the exchange international exchange programs that you host you know in the city of Louisville um, to kind of help uh, the Louisville community better understand you know international affairs and how they affect um, you know our communities that reside uh, in the city. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Abbott and uh, Enetha for you know, allowing us to, to hear from you and, and to learn from you uh, about, you know, such an, uh, you know, very important events um, that have been, uh, you know, taking place in Myanmar. Um, so I'm actually gonna allow you both to introduce yourselves um, before we, we get started, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Abbott. Hi, um, so um, my name is Dr. Jason Abbott. I'm the director of University of Louisville Center for Asian Democracy and I'm the endowed chair in Asian democracy as well. Um, I've uh, been at UofL for 10 years. I specialize in Southeast Asian politics. And so Myanmar is a, a country that I follow very closely, certainly in the 10 years that I've been here. And in fact, um, met with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi when she visited UofL um, uh, in, uh, 20, uh, in 2011, I believe it was. Um, and so, uh, uh, as I was saying before we started, you know, I, I didn't expect that we would be here 10 years later um, talking about the return of the military to power. We were all very optimistic that Myanmar had moved forward from its military past. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, Enetha? Uh, yes, sorry, my dog is evading my personal space. Sorry, everybody. Uh, Yes, um, my name is Enetha, and I have lived here in Louisville for over 13 years as a uh, uh, former refugees. And um, I, um, I like myself, uh, you know, be following the Myanmar politics uh, since since 2010. Ever since uh, Don San Suu Kyi was released from um, house arrest, and ever since then, I was following uh, the NLD and. Uh, the, the Tamador and the political parties, uh, sorry about that, uh, the political um, uh, interactions and all conflict in current states um, and other ethnic areas. So, yeah, it's it's been it's been a year of uh, you know of constant shift and change and surprises and not some not so surprise. So it's ongoing. Uh, um, uh, events that it's happening in Burma, and while it's happening back in Burma, it is f effect on me too, uh, as somebody who came from the country and having family members who have gone through wars and um, conflict and living a refugee camp for ten years, and now we settle here, living in um, Louisville as a as a first generation to, uh, as a working class family. So, yeah. Again, thank you so much, Anitha, for, for joining us. I, you know, I, the purpose of this discussion uh, essentially is to be able to, for us to be able to understand, you know, the history and how, how we got to, to where we are now um, with, with the coup that happened at the beginning of the month, and also to, to better understand how, you know, um, the, event, the events taking place in Myanmar are affecting um, uh, the Burmese community here in Louisville. Um, so starting with Dr. Abbott, could you, uh, set the context for us. You know how how do we get here? Um, you know there there was a lot of a lot of talk of you know this is not your typical coup because of um, you know the way or the form of government the way the government was formed you know prior to the coup happening with um, sort of having the military sharing power uh, with uh, a more democratic um, uh, government. 
So, uh, and I know you wrote a, an incredible op-ed on this. Um, so could you please help us set the context and the background of how, how did we get here? Sure. Um, well, I, the military has, has played a, a prominent role, a leading role in Burma's um, politics uh, ever since 1962. In 1962, um, there was the first coup in that country's um, independent history. So it was a British colony, became independent uh, after World War II. And there was a, a period of tumultuous democratic uh, regime until 62 when the, the army intervened and there was a military coup. And from that point onwards, um, uh, Burma was an authoritarian state. Um, it fell under the leadership of a, an authoritarian uh, individual leader who developed a cult of personality and adopted a quasi-communist ideology called Ni Win. And uh, he ruled uh, until 1988 when the military actually um, staged a second coup to overthrow him and impose direct rule. Um, they believed that they would be able to manage a transition to democracy in 1988. Uh, sorry, in 1990, when uh, elections uh, were held. In those elections, uh, just as in the recent elections in November 2020, um, the democratic forces in Burma, uh, led by the National League for Democracy, the principal uh, democratic political party of which Aung San Suu Kyi is uh, the, the effective leader, uh, they won a, a massive landslide in that election. Um, but the military refused to recognize those results. They uh, subsequently arrested her, put her under house arrest for uh, 16 of the next 21 years, uh, arrested thousands of other activists, banned political parties, and imposed direct um, military rule um, until 2010. So in, in 2010, they began a process of uh, liberalization, political liberalization and reform. They had self-styled a constitution in 2008 that they call that they refer to as a blueprint for a directed disciplined democracy and so the constitution that they adopted did as you rightly said um, provide a key power sharing role for the military in a democrat in a quasi democratic let, let's call it that a quasi democratic regime um, this meant that they constitutionally barred certain, well, there were certain uh, requirements that you had to meet in order to be uh, the elected president or the elected prime minister. These were designed explicitly to um, ensure that Aung San Suu Kyi couldn't hold those titles. One of them was a requirement that you uh, were a Burmese citizen and that you hadn't married a non-Burmese citizen. Aung San Suu Kyi, who had a British husband, therefore was uh, negated from being able to hold the post of president or prime minister. They also ensured that uh, they would hold 25% of all seats in uh, the legislature, uh, in the House of Representatives and in the second chamber, uh, and that any constitutional amendment would require 75% of the vote so that 25% of appointed military representatives was a guaranteed veto on any ability of a constitutionally elected regime to change the rules of the game. Nevertheless, they then opened the country to um, a reform process that many did not expect, including myself at the time. Uh, they released Aung San Suu Kyi. They um, held their very first democratic elections in 2015. They believed that they would be able to control the process. They felt uh, that after 20 years of effectively being shut out of the country's politics, that Aung San Suu Kyi was not as popular as she had been, that the political party, the National League for Democracy, lacked the institutional framework, the logistics, the, the support, the finance to be an effective national force once more. So they were confident that their own proxy party, the uh, Union for uh, Solidarity and, uh, sorry, I can't remember the, the full acronym now, the USDP is a, is a military proxy party. They believed it would win. And they were quite confident that yeah, okay, we can have some NLD members that will make us look like this is a genuine process. They completely mistook 
the will of the Burmese people, who returned Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy in 2015 with um, 70% of the seats that were contested. So overall, the NLD had 60% of all the seats in parliament, and that would include those appointed seats. So they overwhelmingly won a landslide in that 2015 election. And the military was simply not prepared for that. But at that juncture, they had in simply invested too much into that process. Um, it had resulted in the United States and other Western countries removing sanctions that had crippled the economy for the previous decade. And so they reluctantly continued with the experiment. Um, there was, if you like, you know, the military was divided. It was divided between those who were willing to allow the process, those who were never willing to share power. Um, prominent among those who were never willing to share power is uh, General Min An Line, who is uh, the current head of the country, the leader of the coup. Um, and then in March of this last year, Aung San Suu Kyi tried to pass amendments to the constitution that would have removed the military's um, uh, special reserve status, that would have ended its, its veto, would have removed those 25% of guaranteed seats, would have removed the restrictions on her um, being leader. And uh, while they were able to use their veto, I think for the many in the military, including the hardliners, this signaled that this experiment had run its course, that it simply, they were not going to be able to regain control of this. And the 2020 results in November, um, they, they, uh, they provided for those who were unwilling to continue the experiment, the, all the proof they needed. The, the National League for Democracy won yet another landslide and the military's proxy party actually lost seats. It lost four seats on its appalling showing in 2015. It did even worse in 2020. So at that point, um, the ball was very much in the hardliners court and Min Ong Line began the process of uh, creating a false narrative that the election had been stolen to justify seizing power on February the 1st. Thank you so much for that background. Thanks. I think it's a lot to, to, to getting us to understand, you know, uh, why the coup itself, you know, happened with the conflict between those two groups. Um, I'm going to sort of address one of the questions that has been asked already. Um, which is, you know, why use Myanmar uh, versus Burma as the name of the country? And you were talking about this before we went sure. on. Um, and, and so is this part of that political um, history? Yes. Um, so the, the country's name as Burma was the name that the British gave to uh, the, the country um, when it was a British colony. And it is a... Uh, it's kind of a transliteration of a colloquial way that Burmese expressed the name of the country. Um, the official name of the country in uh, the majority language of Myanmar, which is Bama, is Myanmar, but it was the military government uh, that came to power in 1990 that changed the country's name. And so for many activists, both in the country and overseas, refusing to recognize that name change, name change was a political statement. It was a statement that they would not legitimize the military by allowing, uh, by, by recognizing this name change. Now, um, I, I said there's no perfect analogy for, um, that I can think of to explain it in terms of uh, the United States or the United Kingdom, but just a very bad way of thinking about it is the official name of the US is the United States of America, but most people call it the states. And so the states is like Burma and the United States of America is like, is, is a sort of the more formal name of the country. Now, when Aung San Suu Kyi was released, she was asked about this question and she said she was no longer going to let this be a stumbling block to reform or progress. However, what we've seen since, uh, the, since the coup on February the 1st is for many, once again, um, the name has become politicized 
as part of this narrative that once again, the military have refused to re recognize uh, the democratic voice of, of Burmese people. And so for some, calling it Burma, it has become a political statement once more. Thank you again for, for, for that uh, context. Sure. And staying within the political timeline, um, so essentially the when the quasi the quasi democracy government was created, um, Aung San Suu Kyi was sort of given this new uh, post that that was not uh, you know previously part of the government, and sure. um, and and I think you know in the international arena over time she became sort of a you know controversial you know player in 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 the you know politics there and also the, the cultural um understanding of, of 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 myanmar um so within the context of the coup happening in february 1st and 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 and, and her wanting to to enact that amendment um so somebody asked here you know what is the variance between the desired military party and the people's more preferred party um, so in the political context there, um, you know, how exactly, you know, did her, her role play within um, the, the citizens in, in Myanmar? Um, so for, I would say for an overwhelming majority of Burmese, and by that I mean of all ethnicities, Aung San Suu Kyi, for most of the last 30 years, became a symbol of their political resistance to the military. She became a, an icon of the democracy movement. Now, of course, it's when our icons, when our, our political heroes move from being dissidents to being political leaders, frequently the reality of politics gets in the way of the idealism as a, um, a uniting figure. And this is precisely what happened. And I can talk about that in more detail if people are interested in the Q&A. Um, but nevertheless, while there was a great deal of pushback from the international community, particularly because of her stance or her refusal to take a stand on the genocide of the Muslim Rohingya population that's found in the, the Western part of the country, um, Despite the pushback, for most ordinary Burmese, not including the ethnic minorities, um, she remained a symbol of Burmese, Burmese nationalism. She remained an icon. She remained a, a, a political leader whom they had a great deal of loyalty for. Um, there was not a huge amount of pushback from her own uh, constituency for that role that she played. So when the military intervened on February the 1st, um, what you see again is her once more becoming a rallying point of widespread opposition, um, despite the flaws of her leadership over the past five years, her return to being um, arrested and detained has once again galvanized her as a symbol for rallying people for the democracy movement. And you've seen that among ethnic groups as well. Ethnic minorities across Burma have joined the protests that have taken place in the last week, in thousands, including Rohingya as well, I would add. Right, and, and with that, I would like to sort of switch gears with Anita here. Um, and sort sort of get uh, the personal experience um, within this whole timeline that you've, you've um, so eloquently given us, uh, Dr. Okay. Abbott. Um, so, Anne, could you sort of you know give us a picture of you know what was it like for you uh, being um, in Myanmar and you, you mentioned um, uh, being in a refugee camp and coming to to Louvo. Uh, Could you sort of give us a background about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so. I, I come from an ethnic background of the Koran. Um, and uh, historically speaking, the Koran have been the Burma, the Tamadol, um, fierce and oldest enemies. And the Koran uh, armed force uh, have actually waged um, the longest uh, running civil war in the world. So that's something that I think uh, 
when we talk about politics, we uh, Burma politics, we do tend to forget um, why the Tamado exists in the first place. They exist in the first place, I believe, because of ethnic armed group. And uh, so because uh, since Burma gained its independence from uh, Great Britain, um, the the ethnic group that were fighting alongside the British were fi- uh, also asking for the independence. However, the British uh, refused and handed all political power to the Burmese majority. And hence, um, after independence, there's communal uh, conflict um, and of uh, um, uh, communal, uh, uh, you know, conflict intensifies uh, with, you know, between the um, the ethnic Karen and then, you know, the nationalist uh, Burmese. And and in addition to that, um, uh, the military, uh, after the assassination of um, General Aung San, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, father, uh, who had somewhat a more uh, liberal uh and more cooperative uh, uh, politics with uh, between the ethnic and his uh, majority-led uh, Burma. Uh, he was assassinated by the nationalists, and the nationally ever since the nationalists uh, took over the country, um, the persecutions of ethnic minority uh, begins, um, and because of that, the, the uh, ethnic uh, Karen. Uh, um, uh, took up arms um, and um, became, you know, the the rebel, uh, the the opposition to the military, um, and so the ever since then the persecutions of the Koran have been going um, until today. If 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 you uh, be reading news uh, within the ethnic area, there's always conflict between the the Tamado, uh, and the ethnic armed groups, right? So. Uh, my family happened to uh, live in um, current state, we call it Kothule. Uh, and uh, in current state, while Burma is, you know, it's the central government have majority control um, in, uh, in the urban, in the rural area, they do not. Um, and the, the, this, these states uh, have its own autonomous, they run by um, ethnic um, political parties. Uh, so where I came from, it, it was run by the current national union. And so uh, in, in 1990, after the military, there was another military coup. So what, what we know as ethnic people is that when there is a military coup, when there is a dictator, a dictators rule the country, the first thing they do is they march to ethnic areas. They, 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 in, they send in more um, uh, military personnel. They, they militarize uh, places where uh, you would uh, have military during, you know, uh, let's say during the NLD rule, uh, there was a ceasefire and that, you know, they very carefully, you know, the way they, uh, uh, you know, deal with this nationwide ceasefire uh, was that they very secret about it. They're very subtle about it. Now that there's a military coup, they started to send more military uh, personnel in the area. So, uh, uh, yeah, I was going back to uh, uh, me saying that when there's a military coup, the ethnic groups who lives in ethnic control areas are the first group to suffer persecution. And, and because of that, in 1997, my family um, had to fled, me and my mother had to fled on foot, um, um, on foot to um, Thailand, uh, we became refugees. And uh, while, that, while, while we talk about, while the, the coup is, you know, uh, while military, military coup right now is gaining, you know, uh, the news everywhere, uh, the stuff that happened in ethnic areas are not gaining the news. For instance, right now, there are several, over 4,000 uh, Koran uh, became ID placed, uh, IDP, uh, uh, eternally displaced person. And uh, while the, you know, uh, some major news say that it's 4,000, local news have confirmed that there are well over 7,000 uh, became IDP um, since military coup. So uh, right now, currently, while the mainstream medium is focused on central politics in ethnic areas, there's war. There's actually war going on with the ethnic armed groups and with the uh, the Tamado. So that is something that I I hope that the um, the the Western medians, um, you know, major media will pay more attention on because the Tamado 
why do they have a uh, power in politics? Why do they have to create this constitution? Why do they uh, fears of allowing democratic um, process to begin to take root in? It is because they have not consolidated power in ethnic, ethnic areas. They have not, they, their goal is to crush, completely crush ethnic armed group. They have not been able to do that. And the fear that the fear that they might under democratic institution, the fear that this ethnic armed group might become more stronger, might be, become more well equipped. Like you see with the Arkan army, right? Under the NLD. That is what the Tamado fear the most. They, they, they fear that these armed groups, that they will lose control. So they, they as I believe that, you know, uh, this coup is not just to retake control over the country, but to, to somewhat exert its dominance in ethnic areas. And it really sounds like, you know, while, you know, the general understanding of, you know, just hearing about the, the coup is focused on more of recent events, you know, it's Ansang Suji coming into power and and, and, and the whole, whole political career so far, it sounds like, you know, for you and some of your community, this is something that has been going on for longer than in what we're focusing on. And so um, I wonder, you know, how, how is your community reacting to the coup that, that, that took place? Um, you know, how is your family and, and everybody that you are in communication with in uh, Burma? Yeah, so, I mean, uh... It's just, it's just not just me. It's the whole current, uh, most of my colleagues, you know, the past couple of years, we'd be, we be telling the international community that, look, we get it. Why you focus on uh, political transition, you know, the democratic transition take roots. Why you focus on this stuff? Why you channeling, channeling millions and millions of dollars into uh, this joint peace fund, which is supposed to uh, help, uh, uh, monitor which was to help orchestrate a, a transition a piece uh, between the ethnic armed group and the uh, the Tamadok. While, I mean, it's it's a great story when you think about it, you know, the it, it, from Western media, when you read about it, the military is, you know, handed the power peacefully to civilians. And when you read about this, stuff, it, it's, it's stuff that you would see for a movie, right? But then again, as ethnic uh, minority who have been uh, observing, studying, seeing what is happening in ethnic areas. The military coup, in fact, does not do not surprise a lot of eth us as people, as ethnic people. Why? Because while there is a this this vague peace process going on, this armed conflict and skirmishes happen all the time. Um, it, it is not gaining the attention for what apparent reason is that I don't know. Maybe perhaps the Western media or get it used to this 70 plus year of armed conflict between the military and the ethnic armed group. So I guess that it's almost as if like they are expected. Yeah, even there is peace process, even there is democratic transition in the country, armed conflict, armed, armed conflicts go to happen. I guess they have get used to this, you know, this notion and this analysis, I guess, um, of the tensions and the issues in there. And but as, as, as ethnic, ethnic current people, when when um, the, the Gambia case, um, when the Gambia nation, uh, the Gambia took the country of uh, Burma to the International uh, 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 Court of Justice, uh, we in fact went to protest at Washington DC and tell the international community, hey, listen, you know, uh, yeah, it's great that Burma is transitioning to a democratic nation, you're right. At the same time, the military has full control of its armed services. When you have control of armed services, power that's where power light up on. And for some reason, the international community, uh, I guess they, they, they're willing to to go continue to, and, and not only they, they allow to, they allow, uh, they continue to channel the investment and um, fund it into the peace process, but at the, at the same time, you see very less uh, condemnations of, you know, uh, what is the military is doing in ethnic areas. I, 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 
the what's happened in the Rohingya, does, does it have to take more than 700,000 to a million people to become refugees, to, to be forced to the native land that you pay attention to what's happening in ethnic areas? So that, that, that it has been a somewhat uh, a frustrated process as uh, ethnic uh, individual who has been telling the international community that, listen, you must hold the military accountable. A peace med, a peace med does not, does not, will not deter the military for acting the way they act. Their their whole goal is to to somewhat force ethnic groups out of this country, out of the the, the, the native land. So we be seeing that almost everywhere, Rakhine states, Kachin states, Karen state, Kayat state. So so I I hope that the international community, you know while they focus on the central politics, I hope that they also focus in ethnic areas where you can know, you can learn a whole lot more about the, the Tamadol behavior. In the, um, a few, I think it was yesterday or maybe two days ago, um, the Biden administration sort of announced um, plans to, to, to sanction the government. Um, how do you feel, what implications do you feel that may have towards the ethnic minority groups? Um, so with the with this uh, targeted sanction, not the sanctions that they imposed in the past, uh, the, with this targeted sanction, uh, while I believe it will, I mean it 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 it, it does uh, hold the military uh, from assets of billions and billions of dollars uh, uh, in you know there. At the same times, the military they they are they have they have the business entrenched almost everywhere in the country, and they're really good. They're really good with business. In fact, they may in fact better than what under the NLD government when it, when it comes to business. They everywhere they have lucrative business. They have legal business. You know, within the country in ethnic areas, or everywhere. Um, with this sanction. Uh, as ethnic minority, uh, this is what we'd be asking for in the past. Um, under the Trump administration, yes, they have imposed sanctions um, on the generals and including Mel Uh It was not enough, you know, it, it, it was not widespread, not specific uh, target sanction. Uh, with this, with the new sanction announced by the Biden, hopefully, uh, we we'll see some changes in behaviors, but I, for, personally, I don't expect them to change. However, because you have China um, and Russia who are back in the, uh, the military generals and it is a great concern. Um, and the military, I mean, after being sanctioned by international community for well over four or five decades, they still survive. If they can survive, you know, six, five to six decades, you don't think they're going to survive another, especially when millions billions of dollars be channel and invest into the country under this 10 years of transitional period so i'm, I'm gonna open up uh, the floor for questions here in a little bit um but before we do that um in a, uh, i know you you have been advocating for uh, your community and other you know ethnic minority groups um you know advocating for human rights um what is your ask? Um, how can people, um, somebody here asked, you know, how can, can we support uh, ethnic groups that are being uh, persecuted? And how can Louisville citizens support um, uh, the, the Burmese community uh, here in, in the city? So, so I answer with how, what the international community can do, what we as American citizens can do. Uh, personally, I, you know, when the military, you know, took over control of the country with on February 1st. It's not just the ethnic uh, people that suffer. Uh, it is the whole country. Uh, uh, the Burmese people themselves uh, have endured um, decades and decades of military rules and, you know, with, with international sanctions, um, the citizens themselves, they suffer too. Uh, I traveled back to the country right after it was open and I see the brute of poverty, um, homelessness, they're everywhere, <clears throat> excuse me. And so uh, while 
while we as citizens of America or, uh, or the international community, uh, we can, uh, we have the power to influence politics in uh, Burma by simply writing to our um, representative or uh, Congress, um, uh, men, women, uh, senators, we can write to them, we can um, uh, ask them where they stand on the issues. Um, so, uh, the people of Kentucky, uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, in fact, uh, is very, um, have me interest in uh, Burma politics. And he, in fact, uh, when Osama was released from house arrest, he invited um, her and actually um, Osama came to Yeovil uh, once to spoke there. So, you know, engagement uh, with the international community, we can engage in so many forms uh, here in America and we can do it safely as well too. Let's say that if I were in Burma right now, I may not be able to speak with you openly like this, just because just because we don't have freedom of speech, freedom of um, assembly, we don't have this stuff. So here in America, we have this freedom where we can safely demonstrate, we can safely ask uh, our representative um, to be, you know, to pay attention to what is happening um, in Burma. Uh, and as the, uh, the community here in Louisville, the Burmese community at large, uh, everyone is, um, you know, familiar with this uh, coup, you know, most of these uh, individual who live here have ended up here in Louisville. For what reason is that the Burmese military tried to persecute, kill them. Uh, and we're here, we're all here because of that, the military institution that, you know, exists today. And so, while, you know, right now it, it, it feels uh, as, as if what we've been fight for the past, you know, seven decades. And with this short period of democratic um, um, transition period from 2010-15 to until now, uh, the, it, it, at the present, it seems as if like this dark period in Burma history, you know, but the thing is that Burma is a country that there's a unique paradox between light and dark. And while the people have endured decades of military pressure you see there's genuine of kind of genuine of happiness genuine of like generosity among the people um, and the people are continue to have hope that um, sometimes in the future we will be able to join the country uh, under the democratic institution democratic uh, period that that you know despite all this difficulty, the people continue to have hope and desire dreams for a democratic society where all ethnic can coexist together, uh, where, you know, race politics is, you know, far, far behind, we can put behind us. And um, what, you know, these are what we fight for in Burma. And this is the, 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 the ideal is that, that it's, the, I mean, it's, it's no different than what we American people desire. We want to live in peace. We want to live in a society where we can openly express our opinion, thoughts. Um, we can assembly peacefully without being crushed by the police, or we or be arrested, or we can, you know, communicate openly where we will not get detained under arrest. And what the Burmese people fight for is the ideas that here in America the founder fathers desire and dreams, and you know. So yeah. Um, I just want to. Uh come in and, and reiterate something that uh, Aine, um said. Um, when it comes to uh, Burma, when it comes to Myanmar, it is one of the few areas where there is extraordinary bipartisanship between Democrats and Republicans. So we do live in a highly partisan era and in the middle of an impeachment trial. But nevertheless, when it comes to Burma, there is very little difference between Democrats and Republicans on this issue. Um, the land, one of, in fact, the landmark sanctions uh, bill that was passed before the transition to democracy was co-sponsored between Dianne Feinstein of California and Senator Mitch McConnell. And Senator Mitch McConnell, whether you like him or loathe him domestically, he has long been a strong advocate for democracy in Burma. And he has over the years established a personal friendship and rapport with Aung San Suu Kyi. So absolutely contact your senator, contact your representative, 
and show them that you support um, sanctions on, on Myanmar, on the military, and that you support resisting this coup and that the country returns rapidly to uh, democracy and to a real democracy, not to a halfway house, which is the situation that has existed uh, for the past uh, uh, five and a half years. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, and I thought, thank you for you know sharing sort of what your ask is and um, and how we can better support you know you and and, and the community. Um, and, and a large purpose of having this type of conversation is for you know us who are not experiencing what you are experiencing to to get a better understanding of uh, you know what your plight is. And for, for, for many, they may not um, even understand why you're here in the first place. And so thank you again, Dr. Abbott, um, Abbott for um, sharing sort of the, the political history and, and how we got to where we are. Um, so I'm gonna look at some of the questions that we, we have received so far. Um, and and, and uh, you, can, you feel free to, to answer it, either of them uh, unless they're uh, addressed to you. Um, uh, one of the question is what is what is it like on the streets right now in Burma? Um, freedom, freedom of the press, internet access, and how how did, how how is the effect on daily life? Um, is there open uh, open tourism, and what are the sanctions uh, that are put in place? So either of you could answer that. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll come in first, and then I'll let A and I give you some comments from uh, particularly from the ethnic areas. What we see at the moment is a the, the demonstrations against the coup have continued to grow in number, um, despite the imposition of martial law, which uh, forbids more gatherings of more than five people. We have seen and continue to see tens of thousands of ordinary Burmese turn out, turn out on the streets in protest against the military uh, across the country, not just in Yangon, but in Naypyidaw, uh, in uh, Mandalay, in ethnic areas as well. And, and what's extraordinary about these um, protests this time are, are two things. One is the creativity of the protesters. And the second is um, the broad range of actors that's involved. So I'll start with the, with the second one. I'll go in reverse order. So um, before the demonstrations really gathered pace in size, um, one of the extraordinary things that started to happen was that doctors, lawyers, nurses, teachers, educators, they would come out in their, uh, they, they would stop working and demonstrate their solidarity with ordinary Burmese. They would come out onto the streets in their, you know, in their scrubs, holding up signs saying that they were opposed to the coup. I think this gave a great deal of confidence and support to ordinary people. You saw civil servants who were are employed by the regime come out against the coup and show their support. So that's the first. The second is the extraordinary creativity of the protesters. You know, one of the things that we're seeing is a knock on effect from the protests in Hong Kong, where protesters have learned how to protest more effectively. They're using um, Bluetooth applications, uh, something called a mesh network, which although the internet has been shut down, allows cell phones to communicate with other cell phones over a short Bluetooth network. So I can communicate with a person that's up to 100 meters uh, away from me. And through that, you create a, a, a kind of personalized network, which allows protesters to share crucial photographs, information, and in particular, where the military and the police are so that they can avoid them. Uh, you had a dance off in Yangon the other way, the other day, where they, a group of protesters did a, a dance to a Michael Jackson song. You had um, in Shan State, one of the ethnic areas, uh, you had hundreds of traditional boats, which are usually used to take tourists onto Lake Inslee, were used to do a mass um, um, protest on the water. Uh, and then drones captured the coverage of this protest and it got out and, and went viral. The internet, is still being used. People are getting it out over borders, using various virtual private network software to circumvent the controls. What's different between this coup and 1990 
is that Burma is connected to a global communications network in a way that it simply was not in 1990. And so people are getting the message out. They're showing innovative ways of protesting in the face of violence. The police are already using live rounds, tear gas, lace um, uh, water cannon that's laced with chemicals, rubber bullets. There was a a 19-year-old girl in Shan State yesterday was hit in the head with a live round and is in a coma, currently brain dead. She is unlikely to survive. So they're going out and facing, um, they're facing lethal force, but they're doing it in good spirits, peacefully, with uh, music, with traditional forms of protest. So, uh, and it is gathering momentum. And so, uh, you know, the support of ordinary people and sharing this information is is crucial to show solidarity with these protesters. I, 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 I'll just a little. Um, what we are seeing um, right after the military states this coup is that the nation is, in fact, unified more than ever. Uh, during the during this, you know the democratic transition period um, from 2015 to 2020, we in fact see fract um, factions of groups. You see the nationalist, the uh, Mapatha group who are supporting the, um, uh, the nationalist Buddhist uh, called the Mapatha who are supporting the military. And then you have like also others who are supporting the NLD, right? So under when the military uh, uh, attacked and um, you know forced more than over, 700 uh, Rohingya uh, into Bangladesh, you see there are some pro, there's some against it. But however, right after the military states this coup, what we are seeing is that a nation unified more than ever. And especially the protest, which led by many, you know, uh, younger generations, um, women um, who are leading this protest. Well, what, what it tells me is that, and not only that, you know, the ethnic groups are unified. They went on the streets, you know, all sort of ethnic groups went on in solidarity with the Burmese majority say that, yes, here we are again under the military. So what, what, they tell, what, what we are learning is that the people of Burma desire a genuine democratic nation take root in the country. And the military refuses them that. They ask nothing more other than a democratic society. And it, a, a nation that as diverse as Burma, um, you know, it is, I believe personally, it is only democratic this institution and democratic society where the citizens, all sort of background can flourish. Uh, and another thing is that uh, even uh, uh, in the, even in the rural area, you see police forces refuse to take part in the cracking down of the protester. You see police officer who takes side with the demonstrations, um, who while there was a protest, they were lining up, you know, uh, 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 in the opposite of the protest. Uh, there's some actually end up joining the protest. So what we learn is that all sort of people from all sort of background um, in Burma, they do, they generally want a democratic society. And, and because of that, um, and with the energy of you know the youth and and with it with the ability and the skill to connect with the outside world uh, i i am optimistic um about the future of burma i really am um the current you know the current atmosphere may not you know be so uh so shiny and so blue and so you know but what i saw happen since the coup and until today um with the emerging protests from all over Burma. If you see there's a map, it shows that um, literally everywhere in Burma, people are protesting the military. So uh, what me all I will do next, we do not know, but the Tamada do have a, a habit of using violence against protesters. And that is why I'm worried and I'm concerned about. Um, however, uh, you know, the fight for democracy is long, uh, it takes times. And for me as individual who have been here in the United States and look, look at the country far, 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 uh, 
I may not be there to participate in this, uh, you know, resistant movement. But uh, but I'm whatever I, I can do here while I'm here, uh, willing to do it. And uh, what I see, I'm very very much optimistic about the future of Burma. Um, yeah, thank and, you. And just quickly before we go to another mm -hmm. question, I just wanted to add something uh, to pick up on something that Ana said. I think it's highly likely that the military will at some point in the not too distant future uh, come out in numbers to try to crush this uh, pro uh, this protest movement. Uh, everything that they've done in the past 50 years shows that whenever they are confronted on the streets, they are not frightened of using force, even if it alienates them internationally. What we don't know is that, and they don't know, is that this time around, that force may not be sufficient to crush this protest movement. People are emboldened after experiencing democracy for five years in a way that they simply weren't before. Once you've let the genie out the bottle, I think it's going to prove very, very difficult for the regime to simply turn the clock back. But I expect, and I, and I think a and I agrees with me, that they will use force, there will be blood on the streets, but I don't know if in the long term they are going to be successful at restoring their rule. Yeah, there's a Facebook question here. It's specifically on you know, the, the unity with the various ethnic groups. And the second part of that question is, what obstacles stand in the way of the you know, Karen working with the Shan, Kachin, Chin, Rohingya, et cetera, to achieve unity and, and the, the various ethnic groups working together? Um, I, I, I do not know the exact answer to this question. Um, you know, being, even I've been trying to ask this question, why our ethnic groups are united as once against the military? But I do not know the answer to that. But one thing that I know for sure is that the Tamadol is extremely good at dividing a group into factions, into uh, different, you know, subgroup and group, you know, they, they're doing that, they, they're successfully doing that for over several decades. Um, and they, 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 it's very simple. They do this in a divide and conquer policy, you know, to, to somewhat maintain their power, exert power and dominance over these ethnic groups. They're only able to do that because they can divide so after they can divide, then they can insert the power. And you can see that uh, during the, um, even there was a nation, nationwide ceasefire agreement that were agreed upon with ethnic groups in 2015. They, they, they decide to include some and exclude some. Uh, for instance, like uh, uh, with the Korean National Liberation Army, with the, uh, uh, with, with the, 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 the Easter Front, they're able to sign ceasefire uh, with some in the west and the north. However, when even they had this is nationwide ceasefire, they they decided not to include certain armed forces. And so when they signed ceasefire in the east, they went to war, uh, they waged war in the west. Um, and right after they uh, uh, they they uh, discussion of uh, a ceasefire with Arkan army, which in the west, right after they discuss ceasefire uh, and talk. They then, then again, they said the military personnel to the east, and because of that, in December, uh, there was skirmishes, the skirmish, and the you know, well over, like I said, um, four to seven thousand uh, um, villagers uh, became displaced. And uh, now that you know, there's some sort of like quiet up in the north in Kachin State, there's not much you know, noise there, there's a lot of noise in the east right now, so uh. In terms of the ethnic groups, why aren't they able to unite against them? That that question, I, I don't think I will ever know. But one thing I knew for sure is that the Burmese, the Namada, they they just good at, they just good at divided people. Um, and not only they divided people, but they make people fight each other, and they're good at that. So. And then there's a comment here for you, or I think in general, it says the street uh, protests are surely a sign of courage of the people who are willing to risk retribution from armed powers. Um, I was struck by Enetao's observation about hope that people have in spite of the trauma suffered. 
Um, so we are sort of running out of, out of time here. So I'm going to ask the next two questions together because they bring in another political uh, figure here, um, and that is China. Um, Alice Adams asks, how involved is China in the politics of Burma? Do they provide assistance to the military rule? And the second question um, is, as for the new cybersecurity law that is supposed to be in place this coming Monday, do you think there's any way to prevent this from happening considering China's support of the military? What can people in Burma do to keep themselves safe while also fighting for freedom? Um, okay, I'll, I'll, ask, uh, I'll answer something about the China thing. Um, China has long been a crucial support for the military. Um, during the, uh, the, the period of direct military rule from 1990 to uh, 2011, let's say, uh, China really was the only game in town for, uh, for the junta. Um, and so they became very heavily dependent on Chinese investment, on uh, Chinese military supplies. And uh, you know, one of the reasons that some in the military were supportive of the reform process was um, to lessen their dependence on China as a source of resources. And one of the first things that happened in the period of liberalization was the prominent cancellation of a major dam project in the north of the country that the Chinese had invested in. What we know is that a few weeks prior to the coup, um, General Mianang Lai uh, met with his uh, met with a counterpart in China, uh, with uh, one of the highest up officials in the Chinese Ministry of uh, Foreign Relations, and we don't know what they talked about, obviously. But the suspicion is that Mianang Lai went to China, uh, went and sought tacit approval from China for this coup. And, and it wouldn't be unsurprising because China has cracked down in recent months on anti uh, on pro-democracy movements in Hong Kong. Uh, they've enacted a new security law in Hong Kong, which uh, effectively uh, trashes the, 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 the transition agreement that was signed with, uh, with Britain in 1997. They've cracked down on protesters. And so, they, they see a similar situation in, in Burma, in Myanmar, and, and they are sympathetic to it. They face their own ethnic troubles in Tibet and in Xinjiang, where they're under enormous criticism from the international community because of the genocide of Muslim Uyghurs, which in some ways is replicated with the campaign that the Burmese military have carried out against the Muslim Rohingya. So there's a lot of similarities that we see in the strategies that the military in Burma and the Chinese government have, have played. I think it's not unrealistic to, to assume that Beijing has given Myanmar the green light. That means that if the West applies sanctions again, it will be Asian countries like China especially, but also let's not forget Singapore, which is one of the largest investors in the country, who will be the lifeline to that regime. So any attempt to, to, to remove support for the regime needs to bring on board other Southeast Asian countries. Uh, otherwise there will be uh, a big hole in any sanctions regime that will continue to give a lifeline to, to this government. Yeah, I think that's a sufficient answer to the question. I don't think I need to answer anymore. I'll touch a bit on the um, cybersecurity law. Um, there were some rumors that um, the military actually take pretty much the blueprint from the Chinese Communist Party cybersecurity law and going to implement in Burma. And what we know about the cybersecurity law in China is they call this great uh, firewall um, and the, what the Chinese community have been able to do is that they while there is internet um, the the people they are able to connect with the outside world they have their own sort of like society culture within that internet realm where like no other information from outside world can penetrate and the Chinese Communist Party is, is doing that extremely extremely well and not only that, not only that, outside information are difficult to penetrate that wall, but what it's happening within that 
uh, that realm, the Communist Party can monitor it, can check it, can see literally everything. So nothing that can be spoken, said within that group can go unnoticed from authority. So if that if that's what the military is, it tend to do, um, it tend to implement in Burma, what we are going to see is certainly more crack it down on resistors, people who demonstrate, uh, who are anti-coup, anti-military, that sort of stuff. We are going to see more and more and more people go, going to be detained and going to be arrested and going to, you know, have this arbitrary, this, you know, um, yeah, I, I certainly the, the, the military, I, I believe the military will try to implement um, this law before uh, they're going to use violent, you know, if things, if things out of, uh, you know, out of control. So I, I personally believe that, you know, it's it's reasonable to believe that they're going to I implement the cybersecurity law and to charge individuals, you know, using their legal terms and legal law, you know, that violates human rights and freedom of speech. And so I can see that is uh, happening in Burma in the coming future. Um, I just want to add. Uh, I just want to add something that I that, that I think is important to mention is that the military has acted when it has done in Myanmar um, because it thinks that the United States, in particular, is distracted. The United States is distracted because of the internal turmoil in the U.S. because of the the. Uh, ongoing problems from the 2020 election here, um, the trial, the impeachment trial of Donald Trump. The idea is that the media is not watching Myanmar at this moment with the same detail because of what's happening here. And also, we have to remember the military is using the same language that President Donald Trump used in November to contest the election. He's talking about um, uh, fraud on a massive scale um, that has resulted in an election that is not legitimate, that the NLD has engaged in the spread of fake narratives, that it has uh, won this election unfairly, despite the fact, just like in the United States, that independent electoral observers have found that there are not significant irregularities that would have fundamentally changed the result. There are some problems in some of the ethnic areas that's more to do with coronavirus and with ongoing insurgencies that uh, ANI has talked about. But overall, the Carter Center, the European Union, um, Japanese election observers saw no significant irregularities. And yet the narrative of the junta to justify their action on February the 1st was there is fraud. The government refuses to investigate that fraud. Therefore, we are taking power. And I think that's an important point to add that you know, what we've seen here has created an opportunity for authoritarian leaders in other countries. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Abed, and kind of like bringing, bringing it home and, and, and relating to what's happening here um, in the US. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for more uh, for questions. We'll probably find maybe find ways to, to follow up with the questions that we didn't get to. Um, but I want to thank you once again, uh, Dr. Abbott and uh, Anitha, for you know an incredible amount of um, you know a wealth of you know wisdom and and history that uh, you have shared with us. Um, and I think we can, after at least for me, after this conversation, I can better analyze and look at what's happening in in Myanmar and many um, uh, current events happening around the world in a different light. And uh, thank you so much and, and uh, for sharing your experience and you know, opening up to your observations and, and how uh, this has um, affected you uh, uh, directly in your community. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to Xiao Yin uh, to give some closing remarks. Uh, thank you all for joining this conversation. I can't hear you, Jiao Yin, your mic's muted. Yes, <laughs> I just saw that. Uh, well, I just want to uh, echo exactly what Amy said, and thanks for uh, both of you to um, really kind of peeling back all the many layers to this uh, very complex uh, situation. I think we have all benefited from, uh, benefited from this 
nuanced but very articulate discussion that both of you have given us. Um, clearly, this is an ongoing situation, and we hope that um, at least all of us have um, gotten a better sense of what's happening. And certainly, uh, to the points that you both made, we should be writing to our um, congressional representatives about what uh, what is happening. And you know, uh, Dr. Abbott's last point about bringing it home, exactly what is happening in the US is, can, remains an example to what's happening around the world. And um, we are not paying attention right now. So um, I hope that we will be able to make some difference and help you in, in, in some of that effort. Um, before we conclude, I just want to let everybody know, and, and uh, we've put this in the chat, we do have a couple of other programs coming up. Again, our, we, we are about really uh, highlighting all the international issues, the kind of the current affairs uh, concerns that we face as a society globally and here uh, in Louisville, Kentucky and the US. We will also uh, next week, next Thursday, we're gonna be uh, partnering with the Office for Globalization again on a sister cities program. Um, we are doing a sister, uh, sister cities lunch and learn series starting this month. And next week, we're gonna be uh, having a conversation with um, our city um, uh, officials uh, with, with our city, uh, sister city in Montpellier in France. So I hope that you can um, take some time to join us for that conversation. And then on the 25th, we're gonna have a program on digital rights and privacy in the age of disinformation. Um, and that one will look at how companies are um, maybe contributing to a lot of the things that is happening in our country and abroad and everywhere. So hopefully you can join us. Like I said, we have the information in the chat. Uh, you could check us out on our website. Um, and then until next time, um, I hope everyone Stay safe and warm and uh, thank you all for sharing this really interesting and very important um, conversation with us. Um, have a wonderful weekend and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.